the worst beauty trends of the 2000s that serve as a warning for today. As a child who was born in the 90s, I grew up hearing a lot of this bad news and misinformation in Seventeen magazine, in Allure, in the places that I used to go for my beauty education, which was subpar at best at the time. And there are actually dermatologists that made bad mistakes that have spoken about those scents. And today we're going to break down some of those things and actually look for parallels. What happened in the past that wasn't as accurate that we now know, which is going to get us thinking, what is it now that we're using or thinking is great that in 10 or 20 years, we're going to look back at and be like, oh boy, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe you've done this. For example, Kylie Jenner is still out here launching walnut scrubs, which we're going to talk about, but we do have to start somewhere else. For example, toothpaste. I remember so many celebrities in magazines talking about how toothpaste was like this magical spot treatment for acne. Some toothpastes have fluoride, some toothpastes have antibacterial ingredients, which is probably why this skincare myth perpetuated. But when you think of the hard enamel of our teeth, it is so, so very different than the delicate skin on our face. We have a skin barrier, a microbiome that people didn't even really know about or speak about back in the 2000s. We have to support our skin and have integrity for our skin barrier as opposed to destroy it. And toothpaste was basically just drying and irritating. And at the worst, it could actually cause minor burns and irritation if someone was allergic to the ingredients. And lots of toothpaste has menthol. Menthol is still used in skincare and I actually love it. It's also used in certain areas of pain management management and emergency medicine. Menthol, that kind of minty smell, specifically works on the TPRM8. Is it TRPM8 or TPRM8? Somebody fact check me, but it's the receptors that we have for heat and cold. And it can be analgesic, basically pain reducing. So it is wonderful. That's why we have those Ben Gay patches. And maybe on a pimple that helps. Again, I have a very large cyst here. Um, should we get Dr. Pimple Popper to pop this? This hurts. I could use a little pain management right here, but menthol is something that can be used for that. Now, in toothpaste, it's meant to make your breath minty fresh, but for skin, it is just a no-no. Toothpaste can be drying, it can be irritating, it can again cause these blisters to the skin. And when we have things like spot treatments with benzoyl peroxide or sulfur, why would we be going for toothpastes with fluoride? I remember celebrities promoting this, I remember the magazines promoting this as a hack and a tip. And boy oh boy, it is not a tip, it is a trip down memory lane that I do not want to visit. In the 2000s, it was all the rage to do these DIY masks, these ideas of banana and papaya on your face, you know, put some oats, put some egg. People would wipe egg whites on their face and because the egg whites would tighten up when they dried, everyone's like, oh, it's anti-aging and anti-wrinkle. It literally doesn't do anything to anti-wrinkle your face. It just tightens it up temporarily. Egg is probably not the worst of the offenders. Again, there have been many things that people put on their face, such as Dawn dish soap and urine among other substances. And specifically, all of these food items were just a bad idea. I remember specifically doing two face masks that I swore by, and I thought that these were the best things since sliced bread. Remember, I had been in aesthetic school in 2008, 2009, and I had been taught that some of these things, you know, were okay, when in reality they were not. I specifically had a pumpkin cinnamon face mask. It burns your face and makes it red over time. Why would you use cinnamon? Cinnamon is amazing, especially as an anti Oxidant. It's wonderful for the inside of your body, for your blood pressure, etc. But putting it on your face is very different. And cinnamon is one of the top things that can cause irritation and sensitivity in people's skin. And I was sitting here, not even using fresh pumpkin. I was taking the canned pumpkin and I was just mixing it up with some cinnamon and putting it on my face. And I was like, I'm, I'm so ready for fall and winter. It was so bad. And I would put primrose oil in there because some online publication, I think it was like one of the original acne forms like acne.org taught me that like primrose oil was amazing for acne. Just stick to salicylic acid. Get the Bloom Meltdown Oil. If you want a good acne oil, get jojoba oil from Trader Joe's, okay? And remember, acne is inflammatory, especially those whiteheads. So it probably wasn't helping me in the long run. But based on the aesthetic training that I had at the time before I studied anatomy, physiology, did medical aesthetics, did emergency medicine, worked with doctors and derms, I didn't understand this stuff. And a lot of this was perpetuated online without a lot of the fact checking uh, that we really look for nowadays. Another terrible one was the papaya face mask. And you see, this is actually a string that goes through all of these different DIY face masks. There's like a tiny bit of truth in each one, and then it gets just totally extrapolated. For example, papaya 
Papaya is wonderful because papaya enzymes, such as papian, are exfoliating. They are wonderful. You can find them in one of my favorite Dermalogica cleansers, right? But this papaya enzyme, when formulated into skincare or into the Yoglo from Huda Beauty's Wishful, is very different than taking a fucking papaya and smashing it on your face. By the way, have you ever smelled a papaya? It kinda smells like barf. I even stated that some people mix it in with lemon juice. We have a video of me today reacting to that video from like 10 years ago. Even back then, I spoke about using this papaya face mask with things like lemon. Thankfully, I didn't do it and I spoke about sunscreen. At least I had two functioning brain cells. But overall, it was just a disaster. But since then, I have learned. And since then, we've all learned that just because it's food from your fridge doesn't mean it's good to put on your face. Again, oats have beta-glucans, but shoving oatmeal on your face isn't going to get the beta-glucans into the skin where it needs to go. You know, our skin is a barrier. It's our body's largest organ that keeps us and our good stuff in and pathogens and bacteria and foreign invaders out. So getting skincare through that barrier of our skin is actually really hard. And putting food on our face is just kind of one wasting food. I was spending 10 or $15 on this food to make a face mask. And then it was so much that I would put in the fridge. There's no preservatives in my papaya. So it would go bad in a day and it would start molding, smell nasty. Or if I put it on my skin, it would just be a disaster. When I can get a good face mask or like a K-Beauty face mask or like the Ordinary's peeling solution for like $7, like three to $10. Why am I gonna spend like 15, 20, $30 on ingredients for a mask I'm gonna use once it's gonna rot in my fridge and just make my face sticky. You see what I'm saying? The DIY masks were a disaster and apparently Kendall Jenner still uses her avocado lavender one. Um, I don't recommend. Use the Glow Recipe avocado face mask that actually has retinoids in it and that actually is stabilized so that it has things such as good preservatives that prevent the product from going bad. Do that or get yourself like a lavender face mask for like a dollar at the dollar store if you really want. Oh, the things we have learned. <laughs> one other trend of the 2000s was the overly plucked eyebrows. And this is less of a skin, but more of a beauty thing. But I think that the way it relates to today is because of the Botox brows, specifically the Spock brows. You see, in the 2000s, it was so common to have these way, way, way overly plucked brows. Like they literally looked like tadpoles. I even remember there were times that I was trying to learn to pluck my brows because my mom wouldn't let me and I would pluck from the top and down uh, as like a mistake. And I think an aesthetic teacher of mine did that too, as opposed to just plucking up at the bottom. Dr. Morgan Rabak, a dermatologist in New York City has specifically spoken about over plucking her brows as well. And you see, sometimes brow hairs grow back and sometimes they don't. And it was just a thing to overly pluck, especially in the middle here. We would literally sit there and just pluck our eyebrows, making them so wide apart. When in reality, for like good face symmetry, your eyebrows should come to like the corner of your nose, not just the nostrils, but the inner part. And if you actually widen the brow area, it makes the nose look larger versus if you kind of shade it in or have more brow hairs here, it can make the nose look smaller. And there isn't like a better or a worse, it's just, you know, facial aesthetics and how things look. But the overly plucked, super arched eyebrows was definitely a thing. Now, in today's world, we do have Botox and Botox is great if you want to prevent wrinkles because Botox paralyzes the muscle. It's botulinum toxin and it stops your muscles from moving. And if you can't raise your forehead, you can't get forehead wrinkles as easily. Now, the thing about it is that depending on who your Botox injector is or your Dysport injector or your Zeoman injector is, uh, they can give you a Spock brow, that brow that goes doink and it just kind of looks like today's version of the overly tweezed tadpole eyebrows of the 2000s. And specifically, a lot of celebrities right now have been getting like these endoscopic brow lifts or kind of having that fox eye. Some people do it through makeup. Some people do it through actual tape. There is a way to lift the skin by certain hairstyles. Look at Ariana Grande. And then there are actually endoscopic brow lifts that literally pull up the skin, but it gives the brow this kind of straight look. that's a little bit outturned and it gives the eye this lifted look. Now, while this is seen as ideal or beautiful or celebrity approved for today, is this going to be literally the tadpole eyebrow of today's day and age. And that's kind of what it makes me wonder. Same with the overly filled, you know, plumped up lips. Plump lips are gorgeous. Tiny lips are gorgeous too. But back in the nineties and the two thousands, small lips with like those smackers lip glosses and our little choker chain necklaces, those were all the rage and the glitter in our hair. That was like, the look of the 2000s. But now we have these big voluminous Kylie Jenner type lips. And it makes me wonder, is this Kylie Jenner lip, you know, endoscopic brow lift girl 
going to be what the blonde hair, pink tiny lips, big boobed tadpole eyebrows of back then is what that's going to be today. And I think what that means for you is be aware that these things are trends. Be aware that you don't have to fit your body or your beauty to one of these molds because they're constantly changing. Look at the Kardashians. Did they remove their butt? implants or not. I don't even know if they had butt implants. It's none of my fucking business. Bodies go from curvy to skinny, from one to the other. And it's this constant flux of back and forth to make us insecure so that we buy more treatments or procedures or things to try to assimilate. Instead of saying, this is my body, this is my beauty, I'm gonna be empowered by it and I'm gonna enhance the features that I want to because I think they're amazing or I like them as opposed to what media is telling me I need to do. Another thing from the 2000s that isn't the worst of the worst but that I was totally obsessed with and that we now know is not better are those overly fragranced bath and body works, shower gels, shower lotions, the herbal essences, hair stuff. Do you remember? That stuff was the shit. I remember herbal essences had like the straight hair and then like the curly hair and I would buy both of them thinking that one would magically make my hair straight versus curly when I just had curly frizzy hair all growing up and I could never tame it. Although I have figured out how to do it now, but Mains by Mel is helping me re-embrace my curls. Herbal Essences was the shit that I bought and I had like every single color because I think I saved up for like a year and tried to buy them over time. Dr. Kim Nichols is a doctor in Greenwich, Connecticut and she specifically spoke about how these overly fragranced hair stuff and body things aren't necessarily better. And for most people it was okay. I will still say it was like such a fun shower experience. I would buy the Bath & Body Works. You'd like buy three, get one free. And I'd also buy all of the fragranced Lush Cosmetics stuff and I like that Lush actually donated to charities and things, but all of these fragranced things would just bombard my nose. And as Dr. Nichols has said, it can also cause sensitivity and irritation in many people, including on the scalp, where those fragranced shampoos and conditioners go. Now, fragrance is not always bad. Fragrance is not bad in skincare. It's more of a personal preference. But for some people who are super sensitive, for people who have rosacea, for people who have very reactive skin, you may want to avoid fragrances just so that you're not triggering things. Because in skincare ingredients, when we turn and learn those bottles, ingredients are listed from the highest concentration to the lowest concentration up until this magical, invisible 2% line. And this 2% line, they can kind of put things in at any amount. And due to the INCI list, the International Cosmetics Nomenclature Ingredients lists, you have to label what is in your products. But when a brand puts in fragrance, fragrance is an umbrella term. So you could have a cinnamon fragrance or you could have a floral fragrance and it could have multiple things mixed in. These fragrances are what's called proprietary and brands like big brands and big companies actually have fragrance chemists. And that's why if you have this nostalgic smell to a certain product, that's exactly why. There have been studies showing that the Swiffer clean smell is literally a psychological marketing tactic where people don't feel like their house is clean until they smell that Swiffer. Is it Swiffer or Febreze? I'm mixing up my cleaning products. It's definitely Febreze. But the same thing goes with fragrances. There's a reason that we love a specific designer fragrance or that a specific skincare product smells a certain way. That is a psychological marketing tactic to number one, make the product more pleasurable to use. But number two, if it smells like clean skin, just the way toothpaste, that minty fresh feel makes you feel like you're clean, that incentivizes people to buy or to use a certain product because it has that familiarity. And the Bath and Body Works, all those fragrances, they were just, they were a lot. And I feel like they used to be a lot more intense than they are now. So it's not something to be overly afraid of, but it's something to be aware of. And think, if you have like a fragranced body wash and a fragranced exfoliant and then a fragranced body lotion and then a fragranced conditioner and then you're putting on a perfume. You're not going to smell like this nice floral designer fragrance. You're going to smell like you just walked out of a Bath and Body Works and doused yourself in every single scent that they have. So uh, a lesson to be learned for sure. And to take it back to the beginning, we do have to talk about the St. Ives apricot scrub and the fucking lemon. Oh my God, don't get me started. These were things that were spoken about all the time. Lemon especially. This was like an actual hack, an actual tip. Lemon was used to light and hair. It was used on skin. And that is one of the worst things that you can do. Specifically when it comes to lemon and lime juice, if you have lemon and lime juice on the skin or on the scalp and in the sun, it can cause a form of dermatitis, specifically phytophotodermatitis or photodermatitis. When you break down that word, photo means light, derma meaning skin, and itis means inflammation of. So like light induced inflammation of the skin. And lemon is a huge contributor to this as is lime juice. If you 
you ever go to a tropical place where they're making like margaritas on the beach, you may notice that some people get these really bad burns on their hands if they have that lemon or lime juice on their skin and then go in the sun. And literally for people who were putting this lemon on their scalp to lighten their hair, they were getting this irritation in the actual scalp. And I was the dumb who lightened my hair with lemon. And then it stripped my hair of natural oils. It just made my hair like straw. And I already had curly frizzy hair. It was just a disaster. And then for people who were using this lemon on their skin to lighten dark spots or pigmentation, no, use tyrosinase inhibitors. Use things like licorice. Use things like hydroquinone from your doctor or derm. Use things like alpha arbutin or vitamin C, not straight up lemon juice. Do not do that. Lemons are grown in different areas with different conditions and different crops. We can't control that. So one may be much more acidic than another, which is a factor we can't control. Whereas if you're getting something like pure L-ascorbic acid or sodium ascorbyl phosphate, those are forms of vitamin C that actually help with brightening the skin and pigmentation. When using those, we know exactly what potency it's at, exactly how much is in a product. And that product is formulated to actually deliver this to the skin so it can get through the skin where it needs to go as opposed to like lemon juice sitting on top and causing burns. Speaking of destroying our skin. Again, Kylie is still out here destroying our skin. The St. Ives apricot scrubs. Yes, for some people they worked, but for most people they were pretty much a disaster. I mean, put sharp apricot pits onto your face and just scratch. If that's your thing, go for it. But if you were like me as a kid, you used to roll down hills of freshly cut grass and do somersaults, and they would actually leave your skin with like this redness and irritation. Number one, that could be a grass allergy, but number two, those sharp blades of grass would actually cut the skin, and that micro trauma would cause the skin to try to heal it. And this wasn't a micro trauma that was even all over, like exfoliating your skin with sand, which you also shouldn't do, but that I did once as a joke. But it's not this all over. It's literally these uneven, jagged cuts. And that's basically what these apricot pits are. Have you ever seen an apricot pit or an apricot shell or a walnut shell? They are jagged, like tiny little pieces of glass or daggers. And when we rub those on the skin, they're not necessarily exfoliating evenly. That's why for exfoliants, we want to go for things that are either rounded edges, something like rice that is gentle, or things like acids that exfoliate evenly and don't rely on you manually rubbing it in. Because as humans, when we rub things on our face, we don't always do so with even pressure on all areas of the face. This is also why papaya enzymes are great when formulated properly in a product because they can break down skin cells and exfoliate evenly as opposed to unevenly. But remember, that is not the papaya fruit, that is the papaya enzymes when formulated well. And when it comes to St. Ives, they were sued, it was unsuccessful, but they were sued for causing micro tears of the skin. And then knowing that it was a very popular product back then, because a lot of people liked that gritty feeling, again, back to psychological marketing, people wanted that gritty feel to feel like their face was clean. Well, it was a popular product. So when Kylie Jenner launched her walnut scrub, she was like, oh, well, this is a legacy popular product, it's gonna do really well. And then and um, this is like a conspiracy theory, but low key, if you're causing damage to your customer's skin, and then they buy your cleanser and your serum with the Kiwi extract to try to fix their faces, you're causing the damage that you're claiming to fix. Like, I see what's going on here. What are the other trends that you saw from the early 2000s that have just destroyed your skin or your mental memory lane? I was actually asked to contribute to an article with some other amazing estheticians and dermatologists where a lot of these tips come from. And this article on Huffington Post actually has a few more, so I'm going to leave it as the first link in the description that you should definitely click and check out because it was very interesting. And um, they actually ripped on press-on nails, which I use and love, except for when they fall off, which, you know, happens, but I love these. Anyways, let me know what trends uh, from the 2000s have scarred you and your skin and your brain and what things are happening right now in beauty that you wonder about. And you're kind of thinking, is this the version of these bad mistakes that we think are fine that we're doing today that we're gonna look back at in 20, 30 years and cringe that we even considered doing. Overall, remember to stay hydrated, both orally and topically, reapply your SPF, and always be beautiful both inside and out. I love you, and I cannot wait to see your thoughts in the comments, as well as this article, and of course, this next video. <laughs> love you guys. Bye.